Good morning, Prairie Heights. Good morning. All right, it's great to be back. I always love coming here. Love this church, love the staff, I love you guys. And we are in the middle of a series called Follow, Foundations of the Faith. And uh, today's focus is the Bible. Now, when you think about the Bible, do you ever think about the fact that it's actually got a lot of humor in it? It's sort of funny. I mean, let me give you an example. Husbands, let's try this. Let's see if I can help you out. Husbands, let's say that your, your wife has been sort of complaining a little bit. And you go, honey, perhaps we should read God's word. Proverbs 27, 15. A quarrelsome wife is like the dripping of a leaky roof during a rainstorm. How do you think that's going to go over? So then you go, whoops, maybe I should compliment my wife and even try to be romantic, all right? So you read Solomon 4, 1 and 2. How beautiful you are, my darling. Your hair is like a herd of goats coming down a mountain. <laughs> Your teeth are like a herd of sheep coming up from washing. Each tooth has a twin. Not one of them is alone. Dentists love that verse. All right. <laughs> you know, and the Bible can be very, uh, well, some Bibles can be very big. This is, uh, this is my study Bible. I've had it for many years, and uh, I love it. It means a lot to me, and not only for my personal study, but when I prepare uh, to give a message. And uh, so, in fact, you'll find a lot of my message outlines in here and so th this is very important to me. Bibles can also be small. This little pocket New Testament was given to me by my, my godly grandfather when I graduated from high school in 1970. Whew. And my grandpa said to me, Byron, this is for you to take the word with you. And by the way, I think you're going to be a preacher someday. So I appreciate that. So that means a lot to me. Or a Bible can be, uh, you know, coming, come in the digital form. You know, many of you use your phone or an iPad for reading the Bible. It's pretty, the Bible can also be expensive. In fact, let me, let me show you here. Let's put up this picture. I just found this recently. There was an ad in eBay for the John Adams Family Bible. It's over 230 years old. And if you need our history refresher, John Adams... Led the, helped lead the American Revolution, was a founding father and the second president of the United States. So he gave this old Bible, he signed it and gave it to his granddaughter. Now somebody in the family is selling it, offering it for sale for $75,000. Now the interesting thing when you look at eBay, it'll give in the description, I love this, 230 years old, it says used. <laughs> I love that. I wonder if it really was. In fact, do you and I this morning have a used Bible? So important for us to have a used Bible. I mean, many of us here, in fact, if, if you want to raise your hand, that's great. How many of you own at least one Bible? Two, three, four, phone? Yeah, I mean, so, so here's the deal. Is the number of Bibles that we own proportionate to where we're at in our spiritual growth? Interesting question, huh? So when you think about it, it's obvious that a lot of people find it hard to be motivated to actually read God's Word. Uh, so I want to I test you. Some of you older ones, you might remember this. When I was a kid... Here was a song that my Sunday school teachers and vacation Bible school leaders, that they used to get us children motivated to read the Bible. See if you know this. Let's watch. How many of you had heard that before? Yeah, oh, so, some of you were applauding because you knew the words. How many of you were tapping your foot? Yeah, yeah. 
I, I can still remember 50 little kids just belting that out, the B-I-B-L-E. I stand alone on the word of God, and here's my next question for you. Do we? Do we stand alone on the word of God? So let me do a time out here. At any given weekend, Prairie Heights has people like some of you here this morning visiting for the first time. Some of you are here because uh, you moved into town and you're looking for a great church that teaches the Bible. Some of you are here this morning because maybe you were invited by a friend or a family member and you're new to all this spiritual stuff. Maybe you've never even opened up a Bible. That's okay. No matter where you're at today, this message is for all of us. Surveys show this, that over half of Americans have never looked at a Bible. About 30% would claim that they've opened up a Bible to look for some verses when they're in crisis or need. About 20% claim to actually read the Bible on a fairly regular basis. 17% use the, oh, I have a need, open up a Bible, point, read, or scroll in the phone. Where are you at this morning? Why is it so hard to actually get into God's word and read it and take it really seriously? A lot of people say, well, it's hard to understand. Some will say it's too old to be relevant today. I mean, it's really old. Or I'm not sure it's true or reliable. Or here's, here's one that I hear. I just don't have time to read the Bible. When we don't read the Bible, is it possible that what we're really saying to God is, God, um, I know the Bible is important and everything, but I'm so busy, or I got some other hang-ups, but hey, but hey, and God, just so you know, I'm really glad that you're just a prayer away. I really appreciate that, but uh, I just don't have time. Maybe that's the issue. It's how we view the Bible, how we value it or how we don't value it. If we think of the Bible as just being an old, boring relic, how motivated are we going to be to get into God's Word? If we, however, view the Bible as the way God intended it, that it's His Word that he used it to reveal himself to us, to let us know that he wants a relationship with us through his son, Jesus Christ, we're gonna be more motivated to actually get in to God's word and deepen our relationship with him. So, speaking of motivation to get into God's word, let's try to answer this question in the next few minutes. Why value it? Why should we read God's word and apply what it says? I'm gonna give you several reasons. Here's the first one. Because God's word is the truth. God's word is the truth. This is really important because in today's world, today's culture, there is no moral absolute for the most part. Many people would say, well, your truth is good for you. My truth is good for me. You can make your truth whatever you want it to be. But God says his word is the truth. Now, the focus of this message is not to try to get into an apologetic perspective to prove, uh, and with all the evidence available, that God's word is true and reliable. But let me touch on this for a little bit. First of all, let's see what God's word has to say about itself. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. All scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is right and to try to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we're wrong and teaches us to do what is right. God uses it to prepare and equip his people to do every good work. Right there, in a nutshell, that should be motivating us to want to read the Bible and apply it because God has our best at heart. He wants to use it to teach what's right, what's wrong, and then equip us to do the incredible things that he is calling us to be involved in and building his kingdom. The word inspired, if you've been around the Bible for very long, maybe you've read this passage before, but the word inspired actually means God breathed. 
God breathed. God used his Holy Spirit, which Beth spoke about last weekend, to actually infuse, to fill the 66 authors of the Bible with what God wanted in his word. His spirit breathed into them. They had different personalities and experiences and the context, but he breathed into them. In fact, as I was getting ready to to, uh, prepare this message for you guys, I thought about Genesis, and I was reminded that God creates the universe and the world and the, the incredible beauty, incredible creation, and then he creates Adam and Eve. And he takes Adam, forms Adam, and then in Genesis we read that, and God breathed into Adam's nostrils the breath of life. I don't know about you, but I'm going to trust reading what God breathed into the authors because God used his breath to create Adam and us. God's word is inspired. Let's look at some other evidence uh, because people are wondering, is the Bible really true? I love what Focus on the Family has listed as some evidence in its research about the reliability of scriptures. Evidence for the Bible being true. Here's several. Here's the first one. Documentation. Did you know that there is significantly more documentation for the books of the Bible than there are for other historically recognized authors such as Aristotle, uh, Homer, Plato? Did you know that the archaeological findings support what we find in the Bible? Excavation sites and artifacts provide the evidence that many of the places and events that we read about in the Bible, physically we see evidence left behind. How about eyewitness accounts? You're going to believe a story. I'm going to believe a story when I can talk to somebody or read something from someone who was actually there and saw it happen. And that's the case when you take a look to read the Gospels. The historical life of Jesus. The fact that Jesus was a real person is clearly documented by historical Jewish authors, historians. And even though they weren't God-seeking, Christ-following, Jewish authors wrote about this Jesus and what he did. So even historical documents prove it. And then one last one, changed lives, changed lives. We see the evidence of the Bible's trustworthiness all around us. But let me give you a couple from history. When you think about it, There is a gentleman by the name of C.S. Lewis who was one of the the most famous atheists ever. He read God's word, became a Christ follower, and now he's, he's no longer alive, but he was one of the world's leading apologists. Or how about John Newton, a formal slave former, slave ship master. He read God's word, put his faith in Christ, and he's the one that penned the incredible hymn, Amazing Grace. Right here in this room, there's lives that have been changed. Just this last week, my wife and I were having coffee with some friends of ours, Don and Amy, and uh, they're like me in their early 70s, and uh, I was asking them, tell me about your faith story. How did you come to faith? And Amy, 73, said, well, I came to know Christ at the age of 65. And you got to know a little bit about their story. Both of them come from broken homes, not much of a church background. Then they went through divorces. Then they became a Christian and now married and have this large blended family. But she said this, at age 65, somebody invited me to a church that teaches the Bible. She pointed to the big study Bible laying in front of her, and with tears in her eyes, she said, Byron, this is what pointed me to Jesus, and I've never turned back. You know what? There may be some of you here today because we're sharing the truth of God's word. The Holy Spirit may point you to Jesus, and your life could be changed now and forever. Let's look at the second reason why we need to read God's word, get into it, and really apply it. Because God's word reveals his great love for us, his great love. Try thinking of it this way. 
What the Bible really is, is an incredible love story. The love story is about God pursuing us with a, for a relationship. Both my parents are in heaven with Jesus now, and I look forward to seeing my parents again someday. My parents met at a Christian college when they were freshmen. They were 19, 20 years old, and by the end of the school year, they got engaged. My mom grew up on a farm in southern Minnesota, and my dad grew up in a logging family in Oregon. And so they went home for the summer engaged, my mom back to her family, my dad to Oregon in his family. They get home, my dad got cold feet. So what did he do? He wrote my mom a letter, and he said, I can't do it. I don't think I'm ready, I don't think it's right, and I'm gonna call off the engagement. Drops the letter in the postal box. My dad told me this later on. He said, Byron, two minutes after I walked away from dropping that letter, I went, oh no, what have I done? I can't believe that. I love her, I wanna marry her. So what, what does a 19-year-old kid in love do when he sent a letter and now he needs to somehow stop the letter before his sweetheart gets the mail? You know what he did? He jumped in an old car in Oregon and started driving the 2,500 miles to Minnesota so that he was going to try to beat the mail. <laughs> driving through the night, he gets about 2,000 miles and his car breaks down so he junks, he, he junks the car in Nebraska somewhere and he hitchhiked the rest of the way to my mom's farm. And he, nervous as could be, he's just praying it's going to go well, that hopefully the letter didn't get there yet. And he knocks on the door, my mom comes to the door and she's surprised, of course, and then she just breaks down, starts weeping and weeping. My dad goes, okay, I don't think I beat the mail. He didn't. The letter got through the day before. My dad did whatever it took. He went out of his way to pursue his bride, and they were married for a lifetime. God, in his great love for us, has done whatever it took, sending Jesus to die on the cross and rise from the dead to pursue us, not just for this lifetime, but for eternity. The Bible talks about that Jesus is like the groom, and those of us who know Jesus that were followers of his, the body of Christ, we're the bride. The church is the bride. Think about it. His Great love pursues every one of us. Romans 5, 8 through 11, God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. And since we have been made right in God's sight by the blood of Christ, he will certainly save us from God's condemnation. So now we can rejoice in our wonderful new relationship with God because our Lord Jesus Christ has made us friends of God. My wife and I have nine grandchildren. The oldest is 18, going to graduate from high school in a couple of weeks. And then our youngest one is Riggins. He's three. And he and I have gotten to be good buds because I'm retired and I can spend more time with him. And for months he would say, Grandpa, you're my best friend course, as a grandfather, I love hearing that. But one day he's over, and he wanted to play, and I couldn't write then, and so he looked at me, and he goes, I don't love you anymore. <laughs> mm. I said, well, I'm so sorry that you, I still love you. Yeah, well, you didn't play with me when I wanted to play with you. A few days later, he's back at our house, and we're having a picnic in the backyard, and we're just having a great time. And all of a sudden, he looks at me, Grandpa, you are my best friend. And I said, oh, buddy, thanks. I love you. Hey, I noticed you got snot coming out of your nose down by your lip. Here, let me get that for you. And I took a tissue, and I reached in to try to wipe the snot off his face, 
But he was so intent on proving that he loved me, he leaned in and gave me the big snottiest kiss on the lips you can imagine. <laughs> but listen, at that point, I didn't care if I got his cold. We're sometimes that way. When we trust Jesus, we become a follower of his, we have this relationship with God, and what do we do sometimes? Well, when things aren't going our way, or God, what have you done for me lately? Uh, we sort of become like snot-nosed kids. But the amazing thing about his great love is that it's so unconditional that when we recognize it, he keeps pursuing us, he always takes us back. He'll forgive us and help us get going again. Let me give you the third reason why we want to get into God's word and apply it. It's because God's word teaches us how to follow Jesus and be all in. I don't know if all of you were here when Beth gave the message all in a few weeks ago, but I loved it. And in a nutshell, what this is really about, when we put our faith in Jesus as our Savior because he died and he rose again, we become a follower. We're saved. But then there comes more opportunities down the road where we have the opportunity to grow and surrender our lives, to be all in. And to be all in means that no matter what, we are committed, we're surrendered to the idea of becoming more and more like Jesus, to become holy, to be set apart as someone who is becoming like Jesus. In fact, look at what Colossians chapter 2, verses 6 and 7 says. And now, just as you accepted Christ Jesus as your Lord, you must continue, excuse me, yes, you must continue to follow him. I want you to, to see this part of the verse. And now, just as you accepted Christ Jesus. When we accept Jesus Christ as our Savior, we don't earn it, we don't do anything to deserve it, but we receive it by faith. It's a gift from God. And so he's saying, in the same way that you accepted him, receive the gift, continue to follow him. In other words, continue to let him do his thing in and through us. Let your roots grow down into him and let your lives be built on him. Then your faith will grow strong in the, here we go, in the truth you were taught. That's God's word. And you will overflow with thankfulness. Now let me show you. He goes on in Colossians chapter 3, verse 10. He says this, put on your new nature and be renewed as you learn to know your creator and become like him. So becoming like Jesus is the goal. That's what happens when we're surrendering ourselves to be all in. Let me, let me illustrate. Do we have any hunters in the room? Mm, mostly vegans, very interesting. All right. <laughs> Imagine a hunter who wants to train his young dog, a puppy if you will, how to hunt rabbits. What the hunter will do is that he will tie up his dog at one spot and then take the carcass of a dead rabbit. By the way, you know how they say no animals were harmed in the making of this movie? There wasn't a rabbit that was harmed in the making of this story, just, just so you know. So he takes the carcass of this rabbit and he drags it along in the ground and maybe 50 or 100 feet away. And then he leaves the rabbit there. And he comes back to his dog and he goes, okay, boy, here you go. Get excited. I want you to take some steps and go get the rabbit. Rabbit, rabbit, rabbit. And the dog just gets all excited. It's just a step, 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 step. Oh, all of a sudden a squirrel runs by. Oh, then he's going to go a different direction. So what does the hunter who is training his dog do? He blows a dog whistle with a frequency that only dogs can hear. So if you're hearing what I just did right now, you're in trouble. So he blows the dog whistle, and the dog goes, oh, that's my master. I need, come back, come back, come back. So he goes back, and he comes up to the master, and what does the hunter do? He gets down, he says, okay, now, you didn't quite do that right. You got distracted. I'm going to get you back on the path, and you can do it. You can do it. You can do it. He's kind of giving him a pup talk, if you will. <laughs> come on, one dad joke in the whole message. <laughs> one. 
go, rabbit, 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 step by step until he gets the rabbit. God does the same thing. Because of his great love for us, he has this goal for us to become like Jesus. And sometimes we get sidetracked by what the world offers us and we become disobedient. But God will have his Holy Spirit call us and if we respond and go back to him, he'll forgive us and get us renewed and get going again toward the goal of becoming like Jesus. Let's look at the fourth reason. God's word compels us to share our faith. Compels us to share our faith. Now over the 47 years that Linda and I have been married, many times I've had people tell me, oh, you must really love your wife. And I say, I really do. Why do you say that? Well, because you're always talking about her. I've had people say, you, you, you know, I've never met your wife, but I kind of feel like I know her. Oh, really? Why do you say that? Because you're always talking about her. Is anybody saying to you and me, you know, I can tell you really love Jesus. Oh, yeah, why is that? Because you're always talking about him. You know what? I'm sort of new to this spiritual stuff, but I feel like I kind of have an idea who God is and what he does. And oh, Really? Why is that? Because you're always talking about him and you're sharing his word, the Bible. Is that happening for you and me? If it is, that means we're ambassadors. Look what Paul has to say in 2 Corinthians 5, 19 and 20. For God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. This is the good news now. No longer counting people's sins against them. And he gave us this wonderful message of reconciliation. So we are Christ's ambassadors. God is making his appeal through us to the world. We speak for Christ when we plead, come back to God. Are we messengers of the greatest message? Are we representatives? Are we ambassadors? Some years ago, I'm traveling and I've been gone from home and I'm tired and I, I, I just want to get home. And so I'm walking onto the plane, and I mean, I just wanted to take a nap. And I, I hate to admit it, I'm ashamed to tell you this, but I said to God, God, so oftentimes I end up sitting next to people on a plane who have all these spiritual questions and, and all that. And so, but God, um, I'm really tired. I, if you don't mind, I'd love to take a nap. And so, but if you really want me to talk to somebody, would, would you give me a sign or something? So I go toward the back of the plane and sit down, and here's a young lady with her head just looking out the window. I thought, oh, this is going to be good. So I put my head back, we take off, and I'm just starting to get a little sleepy, and all of a sudden I hear sobbing next to me. I turn, and now this girl is looking at me just sobbing. Do you know the meaning to life? <laughs> so I prayed. I said, God, is this a sign? <laughs> See, it's the Holy Spirit that empowers you and me, compels us to share our faith. To illustrate this even further, I'm going to encourage you, Prairie Heights is encouraging all of us here today to consider downloading the YouVersion app there's over 500 million downloads. It's a fantastic tool. My guess is that many of you already have this, but if you, if you have it, start using it. Every day, it has a verse for the day and a short little devotional. In fact, I'm going to give you a one-minute example where Jordan, a worship leader, she shares how important it is that we proclaim the name of Jesus because it's the only way to be saved. Let's watch. Acts 4.12 says, and there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. I love this passage because it actually gives us insight about Jesus and about the Holy Spirit. This reminds us that out of all of the Holy Spirit's power and gifts that we might be attracted to, at the end of the day, the primary job of the Spirit is not to impress with signs and wonders or to give us emotional experiences. It is to testify to the glory of the Son and to make His glory known. 
It is the Holy Spirit that opens our eyes and shows us the glory of Christ so that we can stop chasing after empty things, hoping to be filled, stop trusting in that which will never meet our greatest needs of forgiveness, reconciliation with God, and salvation in Him. Those things can only be met through Jesus, for there is salvation in no one else. I pray today that your lives would be filled with the presence and power of the Holy Spirit, and that as a result, you would cling to the name of Jesus and like Peter, boldly proclaim that his is the only name that has power to save. Love it. And you'll, you'll see the logo on the screen. Uh, I, we just encourage you. It's a fantastic tool. Uh, download the YouVersion app, in fact, if you just uh, if you just, on your apps, Google version or even Bible app, it's the world's most incredibly known Bible app that there is. And that's just a sample of what you can experience. Let's finish up with the last reason why we want to get into God's Word and apply it. It's because God's Word promises us peace and courage. Peace and courage. Last week when Beth spoke about the Holy Spirit... She used this passage, and it's one of my favorite passages, and I'll tell you in a minute another reason why it's so meaningful to me. But I want you to see what Jesus had to say to his disciples before he left planet Earth to go to heaven to prepare a place for us. He says, I am telling you these things now while I'm still with you, but when the Father sends the advocate as my representative, that is the Holy Spirit, he will teach you everything and will remind you of everything I have told you. I'm leaving you with a gift, peace of mind and heart. And the peace I give is a gift that the world cannot give, so don't be troubled or afraid. The power of the Holy Spirit to give us peace and courage. In the world in which we live today, all you have to do is turn on the news for one minute and you go, what is happening to this world? There's so many times it can see, seem hopeless, and that's just the world around us. But sometimes, doesn't it seem like our own world is falling apart? The Holy Spirit will give us peace and courage out of his word. The day after Valentine's Day, February 15th, just a little over two months ago, Linda and I are sitting in our living room having coffee that morning and talking about the snow and how beautiful it was. And all of a sudden, at about 8.15, she just ah, blurts out this, almost a scream, such incredible pain. And then immediately, she started throwing up. She threw up violently about every 10 to 15 minutes for the rest of the day. And at first, we thought, well, it's just the flu. There's a lot of flu going on. It's pretty severe. The night got worse. The next morning, we knew we needed to do something, so we went to the ER. There's like 60 or 70 people waiting in the ER, and she kept getting bumped down because her, her issue was not as obvious as some who had been in accidents and things like that. And so we waited seven hours to see an ER doctor. And meanwhile, she's in pain and throwing up. So finally, we got in, she got a CT scan, and the ER doctor said, well, we'll be back in about a half hour to let you know the results. He came back in about four minutes. He said, the radiologist and I looked at it, and uh, Linda, uh, we have an emergency. Uh, we, we need to save your life. You have a bowel obstruction. Part of one of your intestines has died. And so within the hour, Linda was in surgery. At the time, we didn't even realize how dangerous this was. We found out it's 100% fatal unless you have surgery soon. In fact, we found out that at 36 hours, 36 hours following symptoms, uh, your chances of survival start going down, down, down. God intervened, got her into surgery at 37 hours. So while she's in surgery, I was so thankful that she and I had this moment of peace and courage because of Jesus as we prayed together before she went into surgery. So during surgery, besides calling our kids and updating them and praying together, you know what was going on in my heart and mind? All kinds of scripture. I will never leave you or forsake you. 
You can do all things through Christ who gives you the strength. I have come to give you peace. Not the world's peace, but my peace. Every one of your days was ordained. Every one of your days, God had numbered before any one of them came to be. And at that point, I said, God, don't let this be the last day. But it was God's word through his spirit that I found I was experiencing peace and courage. The good news is that the way God intervened and good surgeon Linda was in the hospital for four days because the surgery was a success, and she has recovered, and she's doing great, and so I'm so thankful. We got to celebrate our 47th wedding anniversary about a month later. Yeah. So let's wrap it up with a little application. version app is one way. Another way is to commit to reading God's word. When I, was a, when I was a little kid, I grew up in a church where I would hear pastors and missionaries talk about the idea that uh, I get up at 4.30, 5 a.m. and pray and read the Bible for hours. And I was going, oh, man, I didn't even know 5 a.m. existed. Gee. And I thought, I will never be really spiritual because I don't want to get up at 4.30 or 5 I don't want to read the Bible for hours. That's not the point. It's not about getting up how early, or it's not even about how much time. It's not the quantity. It's the quality of our heart that says, God, I value your word. I know it's a love story that you're pursuing me, and one of the ways that I can respond to you pursuing me is for me to read five, ten minutes, keep reading the scriptures every single day until I find something that you want me to do, and I'm going to apply it, and I'm going to trust your spirit to help me do it. Can you do that? Another way to apply it is to encourage each other. This is, a, this is the body of Christ This is a family. This is a community. Text God's word to each other. Give somebody a call and say, hey, do you know what I read in my quiet time with Jesus this morning? Encourage one another is an important part of being part of a church family. Let's pray. Father God, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for your living word that it's inspired that it's true, that it's reliable, it's life-changing, it's life-giving. And so, Father, right now, I pray for every person in this room. And first of all, I pray for those who have never placed their faith and trust in you. May your spirit nudge them with your love. Let them say yes to you today and begin the relationship with you. Lord, help us to follow through on getting into your word and applying it. Because we want to serve you, we want to glorify you, Thank you, Jesus. We love you. Amen.